We can talk about the trade aspect. So we're starting to see caps on water use, caps on CO2 emissions. It's the only way, if you leave everything out the market, we'll just go beyond the sustainable limit uh, and uh, we'll run into all sorts of problems. You've got to put in the cap, which is a throughput control. In terms of non-renewable resources, uh, we should use them at a rate no greater than the rate at which they, sorry, we can cultivate renewable resource substitutes. So as you deplete a mineral resource, we should use some of the proceeds to establish a renewable resource substitute. There is a bit of a problem. Some uh, non-renewable resources don't have a substitute. So we might have to ration that over time. But ideally, if it's a very important resource, you use it very sparingly over time and work out that at a particular po point in time when you run out of that resource, you no longer have to rely upon it. It would be a critical use of that particular resource. Preserve and restore critical ecosystems. Uh, the question mark about restore, can you restore a critical ecosystem? But at least we should preserve uh, critical ecosystems. And we sh this is another important one in my opinion, we should confine future exploitation of natural capital with the environment. I know I don't like to use this term, but it's, it's a useful term, exploitation. It sounds like you're raping the environment or whatever. But we have to use the natural environment to get the throughput, to produce the goods, to have the benefit, we, whether we like it or not. And we create waste. So whether that's exploitation in the, the raping of the environment sense, that's, that's one thing or, or another, but that doesn't really matter. But we should confine our future exploitation of natural capital to areas already strongly modified by previous human activities. Why the hell we go into areas that are relatively pristine when we've got areas that have already been uh, significantly modified is beyond me. Because all we do is we row the uh, ecological values of them. Sorry? Sorry, I was just saying that's for the minerals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that, I guess that's, that's the case in some instances. Um, OK. Uh, so with this uh, in mind about the, the role and limitations of markets, what policies are necessary to facilitate a smooth transition to a steady state economy? Well, I've got a million and one things listed here. I, I, don't, I haven't got time to go through them all. Uh, I'll just mention one or two. Uh, this, I don't know if Malcolm Turnbull actually used this term, but... Uh, I don't know, and I don't know if the Greens are starting to use this term, but uh, we may well see uh, the, um, the federal opposition starting to use this term. Malcolm Turnbull the other day gave a talk at the uh, Sydney Institute about using the uh, revenue raised from um, carbon trading to uh, reduce taxes on other things such as income, labour and so on, the employment of labour, so payroll tax and so on. Uh, although that's sort of outside the Commonwealth jurisdiction, that. Uh, but this concept of ecological tax reform is basically that what we ought to do is we should be taxing bads. And by bads, I mean resource depletion and pollution. And in a lot of cases, governments don't, in fact, ignore the taxing of bads. They tend to subsidise it, which is even worse. Why would we want to do that? Well, if we tax resource depletion and pollution, it provides an incentive to reduce depletion and pollution. If you're involved in something that leads to pollution, and it may, like I said, pollution is part of production, uh, but if you have to pay a tax on what pollution you generate, and that's all part of your uh, cost of, of operating in the marketplace, then one way of reducing your cost, and perhaps getting a competitive edge when you're taxing pollution, is to reduce your pollution. So it provides an incentive for firms to reduce their pollution, both now with what technology you've got but also provides an incentive to develop an uptake resource saving and pollution reducing technology. And these sorts of things would increase ratios two and three. Like, you know those four ratios I was talking about, which are actually in decline? It might boost them. So if we did this sort of thing, we could move to a steady state economy, non-growing economy, have all these things going on, and the cost and the benefit curves would widen rather than narrow, and our GPI would go up and we'd all be better off. Well, we should. Why don't we? Well, that's a political issue, a question. So that's one. I'll get on to that. It's a, very, it's a very good point, that. There is a slight weakness with this uh, ecological tax reform that I'll get to soon. Uh, all right, but, but if we increase our taxes on uh, bad, such as resource depletion and pollution, uh, what we could do to minimise the tax burden is we could reduce taxes on goods, and I don't mean goods as in a physical thing, but good things such as income and labour, provides incentive to employ more labour, uh, which would help reduce unemployment. And I might not have time to talk about unemployment, but this idea that we're at full employment is a load of nonsense. Okay? 
Uh, there's a centre of full employment and equity at the University of Newcastle which has worked out that the effective unemployment rate in Australia is about 8% relative to using or comparing un the unemployment rate of Australia in the early 1970s. There's still 450,000 Australians unemployed. 90,000 of them have been unemployed for 52 weeks or more and there's about 500,000 Australians who are underemployed Right, they're working fewer hours than they would like, and 70% of them, that's 350,000 of them, are working at least 10 hours fewer than they'd like to work. So uh, this idea that we've got a labour shortage, there's no labour shortage. We've got a skills shortage, and the problem is that the government, through its you know, education and training programs and institutions, what have you, is not matching up labour, the demand for labour skills with the supply of labour skills. That's where the problem is. We've got... And, uh, I'm not being uh, um, disingenuous to accountants here, but we've got too many people going to university to, to do an accounting degree. All right, we're not matching the skills up with what is being demanded, with what's being supplied. They may well, but uh, but you saw the Indian GPI before. It's not it's not it's not as high as ours, and it's going nowhere. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, and of course, these things here uh, on this particular side would increase ratio one, which would shift the benefit curve up. So these things here, uh, tax on bads, helps to lower the cost curve. Uh, this other one tends to uh, lower, sorry, raise the benefit curve. And of course, the tax changes can be done in such a way as to ensure that the overall reform package is tax revenue neutral. So the government doesn't increase its tax uh, take, it's exactly the same. It increases its tax take here on things that are horrible and nasty and we don't like and reduces it here on things that we do like. Um, now, uh, I think Mark raised the issue when he introduced me before about the idea that uh, if we do this, then it makes it difficult for poor people to afford petrol and things like that. Uh, best way to deal with that one is to say, firstly, the rich always have a benefit. I mean, they have a benefit in buying petrol right here and now. Uh, so uh, it's not as if you have a, a bowser for rich people and a bowser for poor people. We all pay the same. So even if this was to make uh, petrol perhaps unaffordable for the poor, that is not the problem of taxing pollution or depletion. It's a problem with the distribution of income and wealth. That's a distribution issue, not uh, an issue in relation to how we're using our resources. So if we want to overcome that problem, we deal with the distribution issue. So these arguments against this about the poor won't be able to afford higher petrol, higher electricity and so on, uh, we just make sure that if we do things that lead to higher prices for petrol and electricity, we compensate the poor. Because the rich won't like that. Um, but, sorry? Uh, <laughs> and, well, and so, but... Uh, well, yeah, well, well, of course, we, we've also got this uh, reduction in the, you provide service, but we've also got a reduction in uh, income tax. All right, so this is, is a reduction in income tax here as well, which can sort of offset it to some extent. It, the, of course, the poorer you are, or the lower your income, the less is that tax, income tax cut going to afford the, uh, the rise in petrol price, which affects everyone equally, whether you're rich or poor. But that, again, is a problem of redistribution. Governments have to deal with that. They don't really want to do that much anymore. So that is, that is, that is a problem, and it's an issue that has to be dealt with in terms of ecological tax reform. Uh, now, the other... So that's ecological tax reform in, in a nutshell. Just the other one I perhaps want to talk about uh, before I just list a few others, uh, and you can raise questions about them. Uh, is this one about quantitative throughput controls. I mentioned the fact, is, the fact that we can't re rely upon markets to achieve sustainability. We have to have quantitative throughput controls, things like a cap on the amount of water we use, the cap on the amount of fish that we take from uh, the Gulf or wherever, a particular part of the sea and so on. Um, cap and trade systems uh, embody the three policy instruments that I've been talking about to solve these three major policy goals. Ecological sustainability, 